Hello and welcome everybody, or rather should I say Hola Barcelona. Very, it's a great pleasure to be here and I went to, I'm very happy to be in Barcelona because this is my first time not only in Barcelona but in Spain in total. So it's really great to be here. Maybe first a little bit about who am I, a little bit about myself. My name is Tomek, I work at Docato Technology where I'm a software development team leader. Uh, but a part of being a team leader, I'm also a Java developer, Scrum Master and Agile Trainer. And if I had to find a common denominator for all the things I do at Ocado, it would be the people. I'm generally working with people no matter what I do. Is it being a team leader, programmer, etc. You always work with people and this is what I really focus on. Because happy people, when they have all they need, they develop awesome products. So, as I said, I do a lot of people stuff, but on Java conference you cannot speak about people too much. You are expecting technical stuff, I would say. So, as usually I do much more soft presentations, but today I'm trying, I will try at least to do a little bit of technical stuff. So I hope uh, I won't be getting into soft stuff too much. So, when I was, I got feedback after a few of my first presentations, yeah, the, the, it was that I should do, be more technical and I thought, yeah, challenge accepted. And this actually what I'm going to show you today is my first presentation that was a bit technical. So today I want to present you a presentation of topic, epic battle, zombies versus mutants. So let's start with zombies. And to be more precise, let's think about why do people like them, right? Because if you look at the movies, for example, how many movies there are about zombies? Well, you can at least name a few, right? The Walking Dead, for example. Okay, it's not a movie, it's a TV series, but come on, it's super popular, right? Everyone knows that. If you go further, it's something like Resident Evil. And when I was preparing this presentation, I did some research about zombie movies, and I started to find some very dark corners of the internet. And actually, yeah, there's Zombieland, like zombie comedy, okay? But if you go deeper, you find something like Zombie SS, Attack of Nazi Zombies. Can you get it? It's a Norwegian movie. Oh, are there some Norwegians in here, guys? What's up with you? <laughs> and <laughs> how can you come up with this? <laughs> but no worries, you're not at the top of my list, because then I found something which was, I was afraid to see, and it was zombie strippers. <laughs> That's bad. There's a, this is something to only like a really cinema enthusiast to see. I think it's like too good to be seen by regular people. And if you look at Spanish cinema, well, there are also movies about zombies. Well, there's of course this Rex series, which I watched, I enjoyed. Yeah, so you, even in Spain, you like zombies. Everyone likes zombies. And I even found a reality show about zombies in your TV. And this is Ganja Shore. <laughs> but no worries. We have this in Poland too. <laughs> it's spreading. <laughs> okay, so laugh, laugh, but well, Let's play a bit about a so, 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 I can't even pronounce it, sociologist. So let's think about zombies and how they influence the society when they are around. Where first thing, what does zombie do? It crawls, right? It's searching for food. In general, it does nothing. And if you don't have any purpose, you won't bring anything valuable. That's obvious. Another thing that zombies has a drawback of zombies, a disadvantage of zombies, is that they consume resources. In general, zombie eats non-zombies, right? So people, the things that don't do anything good, it does ones that actually do something good, which sucks a little bit. Another thing, if you look at all movies about zombies, when they show up, there's like panic, fear, terrible scare or everything, so they spread negative emotions around, <coughs> right? Another thing, also from movies, they show up in the worst possible moment. If you watch The Walking Dead or anything like this, there are, like, there are these doors. There is light behind these doors. You just need to get there. And this road is empty. There's nothing. You go there and zombies straight away. And again, panic, fear, being scared, whatever. 
all the negative emotions come around and they show up in the worst possible moment. When you felt this safety, when you felt like home, there are suddenly zombies. And the last thing is, well, they spawn really quickly, right? If they eat another zombie, it's, oh, sorry, if the zombie eats non-zombie, it would be okay, because, okay, zombie, zero, humanity, minus one. But it's worse when they bite another person, non-zombie, it's zombies plus one, humanity minus one. Not fair at all. So they spawn really, really quickly. Why we are talking about zombies today, you might ask. Well, let's think about zombie analogies in our IT world. First of all, everyone knows people that are like this. Without coffee, uh, you can see them in the office in the morning like, oh, coffee, you know. So they are here, but okay, not about people. There is a, oh, but one more thing. There is a very nice category of people, it's like zombie employees. <laughs> <laughs> Those are like exactly the same. Everyone has in the office someone who's like spreading negative emotions, moaning, spreading this, you know, it's like biting. But I don't know if they bite, I haven't seen that, but everything happens in IT. But you know, that if there's a one moaner in the team, usually you have another one and another one, and then it's like a zombie apocalypse. So, I was not going to talk about people today, so let's leave it. Today, our analogy to zombies will be zombie tests. So, the question is, what are zombie tests? First of all, those are tests that are not checking anything. They are just there. They run on your continuous integration, but they are not doing anything Correct. They are not checking anything. They are not checking any behaviors, nothing. They are running. Someone wrote them, left them, and they are there. Why? Maybe because they wanted to increase the coverage, which is like super important stuff. But they are not testing actually anything. Another thing, the zombie, why zombie tests are analogous to our real zombies from movies? Because just as zombies from the movies, they consume resources. Time of your builds, your time. These tests that are not checking anything are still executed. You run them on your Jenkins, on your Team City. They are making your tests longer, your builds longer, your deployment process longer. You waste the most pressure resource in the IT, which is time. For something that is not doing anything, not testing anything. Again, another why zombie tests are the same as zombies because they fail where you really need them. Just like zombies showed up when you had like one step to be safe, zombie tests fail in the worst possible moment. When? Where there is a bug on production. You put something on production, there's a bug, but why? You tested it. Coverage 100%, tests are green. Per everything seems perfect, but then you look, okay, but we've tested it, but these tests are not checking anything. We, these tests are not covering anything. Bug was there, they didn't find it. And we had this bug on production. So as zombies, they show up in the worst possible moment. The same as zombies, they spawn very easily. When someone makes a test that is not high quality, not checking what it should check, well, someone <laughs> later on, someone will for sure copy it and make another test. It was working here, it's working there, right? Why not? So, the zombies also spread around. The zombie tests are spreading around just like regular zombies. And one difference for the end between... Be, okay? Okay. <laughs> so, the one last difference between zombies from the movies and zombies in our tests. Well, this difference is that if you see zombie on the street, you can recognize it, right? You can see that he's walking like this, here's some meat, etc., etc., and he's with brains, right? You can recognize it, and you, can, you have two options. You can either kill it or run away. If you kill it, this is called addressing your problems quickly. If you run away, this guy will come back and bring some friends, and this is called a technical debt. So it's, rather, it's better to kill it quickly, okay? But how many zombie tests are there? When you look at zombie, this one, you recognize it very quickly. But how you recognize that your test is not actually testing something? How do you recognize? It looks like every other test. It has some nice code, it's shining green, it's not saying anything on your continuous integration, all is fine, but it is possibly there. So how can we find with this? I'll try to answer this question. But now, we've talked about zombies, so let's talk about mut mutants for a minute. Well, 
Mutants isn't something that people like, right? No one really likes them. When I remember my primary school and stuff like this, when you were calling someone a mutant, it wasn't to make him feel better, right? No one likes mutants, right? They are not really pretty if you look at them. Um, but if you think about, look at movies actually. We are looking about movies with zombies, so let's look at, at movies with mutants. And for example, this guy, Hulk. It's not a very pleasant mutant, I would say. He had this terrible hobby, Hulk crushes, and he was crushing everything. So. He might be not the best example, but if you look how this movie ends, if you look at Hulk, well, you can see that this guy had a really good heart. Down there, beyond this pile of green muscles, there was a good heart. And if you look at x men if they show up, if you look at them, they show up for a second. You have to be an x men to spot it. <laughs> but if you, yeah. I do a bit problematic. Yeah. No. <laughs> this is a kind of a game. <laughs> I don't know. I should say something during this pause because you know. <laughs> Maybe someone knows a joke or something? <laughs> I can go for a while without slides, but the live coding without projector might be a bit difficult. <laughs> to take a water. Okay. Next time that something happens, I just need to try to grab a water and everything works. <laughs> okay, so X-Men. Zombie, uh, sorry, movie about mutants, right? Of course they were fighting the bad zombies, but in general, they were doing really cool stuff. And they were helping the humanity. They were trying to beat this evil mutants. They were hoping, help fighting for peace on the, on the world, yeah? So they were quite good. But okay, there were some bad mutants in this movie. But look at Spider-Man. This guy was really pure guy, like, he was doing everything right. Of course he had this episode at the very beginning, but he needed some Uncle Ben's help, and great power, great responsibility, this stuff. And he became kind of a role model for people. So he was a very good mutant. And if you look at mutants, even though it's a kind of a negative word, you can see that these mutants have really great powers. And these great powers can be used for good stuff. And as I was saying, that zombies were an analogy to zombie tests, our mutants today will be an analogy to mutation testing. I promised you a battle, so let the battle begin. On one corner, we have zombies. You know, these guys, not walking too fast, not doing anything really. On the right hand side, run right hate corner, we have mutants. What they can do? They can control weather, they can heal their wounds, they can read in your mind. For zombies, this might be not the best ability, <laughs> but they can do this. And they can do a lot of different cool stuff. So what can be the result of zombies versus mutant battle? The, re the result can be only one, right? Mutation testing kicks zombie test. Just like mutants kick zombies, they, kick, they win with zombies, mutation testing is the one that is able to get rid of your zombie test from your code. Okay, so what is this mutation testing? Well, mutation testing, first of all, it does not test your code. Mutation testing, for, to explain it, we need to go a bit deeper. Because mutation testing, are test, mutation testing is in general testing your test. It's checking if your tests are the right quality or if they are zombies and have holes like Swiss cheese, right? So, how does this work? Well, it works pretty simple. First of all, you have to have a code and the test for this code. If you 
have a project where you have only code without test, you have a bigger problem. Like mutation testing is not really for you, right? You have to have these tests. Let's assume we have a healthy project here. <laughs> so we have code and we have tests. What is mutation testing doing? First, it's doing mutations in your production code. It's like adding some little evil mean changes that are breaking your code and this is the first step. The second step, they run all your tests again and at the end they check if this evil changes, the small mean changes were actually detected. If your tests detected the problems in the code or just left it just like that, all it was green, okay, you can go with this on production. Right? So this is the idea of mutation testing. So, if mutants were detected at the end, it means, yeah, all is fine. But on the other hand, if, you don't, if your tests are not detecting the, the, the mutations, this evil changes, well, it's a sad frog, right? Your tests are pretty poor and you have holes in there and they are missing some bugs that were put into your production code. Okay, another question you might have, is this something new? Well, no. Mutation testing isn't new, but this is not a history class, so I'm not going to tell about it. So the much more important question is, why now? Why now mutation testing is getting popular? Why we are talking about this on conferences? Why I'm using this on my, in my project now and I wasn't doing this two or three years ago? The thing is that there are finally some proper tools for that. And the tool, and this is the most important slide on my presentation, is this. P-test. I don't know if you've heard about it. This is a tool for mutation testing which I'm using and I'm recommending. It's working and it works good. And I will try to show you this a bit in action. So, there is a good tool finally. There are some crappy tools too, mainly some academic projects, but this is something I will also not mention at all because I rather want to tell you about one thing that works than ten things which mainly don't work. So, Getting back to the topic why now is the performance issue. Mutation testing for a long time, the idea isn't new, but there were no tools that were working in the right time. And we didn't have a history class, so let's have some math. Let's assume you have a healthy project where there is a code and there are tests. First thing, we have 500 classes. Let's say this project compiles for 30 seconds. We have two minutes for our unit test suit and we want to we want to add 10 mutations per every class. What I mean, on average, we want to put 10 these mean changes, these small bugs, and we want to check if our test will find it. So if we do some simple calculations, how long will such thing take? We need to, after every mutation, you need to run the compilation and execute your test because maybe two mutations will affect each other, we need to do it in isolation. So we need to calculate all this. And if we do quickly the math, right? This was 500 times uh, 30 seconds, like eternity. It takes eternity. This mutation test were fine if you had three classes in your project and then was it. What changed? Why p-test, why pit in short, why it works better? It works better because it's clever, as most of things. Well, what is the difference? You remember that um, you needed to compile everything because you made changes in your source code. So you needed to compile everything to run your tests. P-test is more clever because it's making changes in the bytecode, not in the source code. So what it gives you, you don't have to recompile all your, all your code before you want to run the tests. So. This was like 30 seconds of compilation time, yeah? So we get rid of it for all the cases. This is like half of eternity less right now already. But the second thing, and this is very important, is that PIT is much smarter because it doesn't run all the tests. What it does in the first step, it runs the coverage. It checks which lines of our code are affected by which test. And it runs only, if it makes mutation in a given line, it runs only the tests that are touching the line. So you don't have to run all your unit tests, you just run these that are actually checking this piece of code. Again, a big performance boost. And the third thing is that actually it's not running all the tests just like that, but it's checking 
which tests are first. Uh, sorry, which tests are the fastest one? Because if you find the mutation, if you find the bug early, you simply, if you run the simplest test, the, sh the fastest test, and you detect it, you don't need to run all the long running tests. So this is why it works better. And how does this work? Well, the actual mutants, what we have there, actually, PID is very cool because it has a very good documentation, so I won't be giving you all it does. It's something you can read yourself, it's not a problem. The documentation is really good, but I will try to tell you the most important parts so you, under, you see what the mutation testing is about. So we have some things that are called conditional mutators. What it does, it mainly affects your conditional statements, if statements, right? So if, for example, in your if statement or anywhere, you have something like A is smaller than B, p-test will change it, for example, to A is smaller or equal than B, and then check if your tests are actually covering such a border case, corner case. So this is something which is called like boundary condition mutator. You can also do negation. If you somewhere in your code have that A is equal to B, it can become A is not equal to B. If you have A equals B, you can completely remove this condition because you can simply change this into true. And the code inside the if statement will never be executed. Also, it can change if A equals B to true, but it also can change A equals B to false. So th this is the case where it never be executed. If true, then your this code will be always executed and the else clause will be never executed. So it's making some mean changes, very small mean changes, and checks if your tests are detecting those changes or not. Something like return value mutators. If your code somewhere returns an object, well, why not return null? If your code returns true, let's change it to false. If it returns some kind of an x, some integer, let's change it to x plus one. You can see that the, the thing is that these changes are pretty simple, but what you need to understand uh, is that you, you need to remember that this is done on a bytecode level. And the problem in general with mutation testing is if this change in the code we're actually compiled, if this change is not breaking your program. So this is like mainly very simple operations just to check if your tests are covering this, this most common cases. What do we have more is math mutators. I told you that instead of x you can return x plus one, but if you have somewhere addition, it can be changed to subtraction. If you have somewhere incrementation, it can change, be changed to decrement. And if you have minus one, why not change it to one? Just remove minus an array operation, operator. So we can negate this, right? Something like constant mutators, if you have somewhere a declaration that A equals to one, why not change it to A equals to two or to 42 or whatever you want. If you have, oh sorry, if you, also there's this interesting part, you can remove all void methods, all void calls. If you have a method that is not returning anything and you remove it from bytecode, actually this code is still syntax, syntax is correct. It will compile. So you can simply remove it at all and see what happened if your test will actually check it will find that you made such a kind of a big change, right? You can remove a big part of your logic. So method which return void, which are void, will simply be removed. And there's a lot of these changes, right? But it sounds kind of cool. There are some changes, some tricks, but it's a kind of a magic, I would say. All right, it's, there's some stuff happening down there in the code that executing tests, and it's a lot to say in one time, right? And this is just theory. So what I want to propose you is some action. So let's do some live coding and let's write a piece of code and see how mutation testing works in practice. So now let me get back to my laptop. Okay. No. <laughs> okay. Okay, hope it's visible. Is it big enough? It's okay? Perfect. Okay, so we are doing to do a very, very simple exercise. We'll write a very, very simple algorithmic piece of code. What I want, what is the task? The task is, as it's said here, we're going to count some prime numbers. 
What do we want to do? We want to count prime numbers lower than some given integer. Simple as that, right? It doesn't feel like a very difficult task. But let's do it. Of course, let's do this kind of TDD, so I'll write test first. So what? Let's write some test. What can we check? I don't know. Um, 10? How many prime numbers are lower than 10? 2, 3, 5, 7, 4 prime numbers lower than 10. So let's write a test for it. So should uh, find 4 primes lower than 10. Sounds good? Answer that. Whoops. Prime numbers, count prime numbers lower than 10 is equal to 4. But probably one test is not enough. Let's add, an, uh, let's add another one. For 11 nothing will change because for 11 there is no smaller prime than, than uh, there's no another prime, yeah, prime number. So let's get 12 because for 12 we will catch 11, right? So we will have 5 prime numbers. So the, the result will change so this sounds like a good test. So let's put 12. For 12, of course, let's change the name, test method name also. So for 12, for, as an input, we should find five prime numbers. Let's run this test. Of course, they won't be working because there is no implementation. All right. So let's write this simple code. I prepared like a, let's say, stop for this method. Okay, so let's create the simple, we will do this in the most simple way. We'll simply count the variables. So we have count equal to zero. Simplest code possible. From two till n, we go through every number lower than our input. Two is the first one, so we don't need to check one and zero. For two is the first prime number, of course, this is what I mean. So if our number is prime, let's extract it to some different method then count plus plus. Of course we need to implement this is prime method but it will be also very simple. Oops, sorry. Some macro executed. What we need to do? We need to do the same. So for... Oh yeah. Let me grab the water. <laughs> no, it's not helping. <laughs> Yes. Okay, so we're getting back to the code. So, we are checking these prime numbers. So again, the algorithm from, I don't know, the first year of your studies, we're going from 2 till, let's say, n. We can go to square, but it doesn't matter in this case. If our, can, our n modulo i equals to 0, meaning we have found a divisor of our candidate for prime number, well, they simply return false. If there were no divisors for our number, we simply return true. Okay, the code is done, I think. It, or maybe you have some remarks. <laughs> Let's run the tests. Let's see if they pass. They pass. That's a good mark, a good sign, yeah? Let's do something more. Let's run prime numbers test with coverage. And what you can see 100%. So, that's perfect, right? We have our business logic, we have tests, the tests are green, and we have 100% coverage to the production, yeah? All is, all is covered, what can possibly go wrong? Okay, but let's try what mutation testing will show in this case. In general, adding PIT to your project is takes around five minutes. You just need one dependency in your POM file and you can execute mutation testing. So I have here PIT plugin and let me run mutation coverage. Oops, what's happening? I told you, it's running on bytecode. And when I did, I cleaned the project 
There were no bytecode generated, and I ran mutation testing, and I see no tests are there. Oh, come on. You know, this is like live demo happens. Now it should work. And yes. OK. Four seconds. In general, in my projects, the mutation testing is taking less than one minute. Well, we have microservices, so it's like not much code there and not many tests, but we can actually execute it on continuous integration all the time. So, as I told, with PIT, it's not really heavy to, it's not time consuming to run mutation testing. So, you can do it really in all the projects you have. So, the most important thing is now we run the mutation test. We can read the logs, but logs are not that interesting. So, let's look into the report which is generated in HTML. So let's go to our prime numbers. The coverage you can see in here. The coverage, line coverage is 100%. All lines are covered. The problem is that mutation testing shows that only 11 out of 13 mutations were found. So let's see what happened there, what went wrong. First things first, this line. What we have in here, what survived? Change conditional boundary. Pete changed the conditional boundary in here, and what happened? The, all the tests passed. So let's fix it, right? Because now once there can be a junior contractor which comes to our code, put equal mark in there, equal sign, and the code will be working as it should. The test will be showing that everything's fine. We will push it into production. So let's write another test. Let me close all this. Oops. Let's write another test. Let's write a test. Let's use famous copy-paste method. Okay, let's, what will be the good test for border conditions? For the first prime number, okay? Below two, there should be no prime numbers. So below two, we should find zero prime numbers. And you can now see that in the code, when I will make a mean change and I will change the boundary of our for loop and I run the tests, oh, let's run the test. This was failing. Without this test, which I right now added, I wouldn't know about it. That my, my logic is not now, now Sorry, the logic is now not checking if I'm, I'm not counting the numbers lower than some given input, but lower or equal than. So I changed the business logic, I made a bug there, and I don't know about it. Now I added this test, so it's showing me that actually there's a problem in the code. When I right now remove this sign and run my tests, now it's all fine. Okay, but let's run mutation testing once again. This time I will run clean and test, or to be secure, let me clean install. <laughs> Last time it worked, so now it will work too. <laughs> okay, so I've run my test. Of course, the coverage is still 100%. I have even more tests. Let's run mutation coverage. Again, around four seconds to, to run this. And let's see if this, you remember there was one error, but there was also the second one. Let's see if it was fixed. Actually, it wasn't. The thing that is happening in here, the problem we have in here, is that negated conditional survived. What it means? It means that if I have this if, made, if statement, I can negate it, and my test will still tell me that everything is fine. So let's check it in the code. Look what I can do now. If I completely, if I completely change the business logic I have, Instead of counting prime numbers, now I be, I'll be counting complex numbers. I made this bug. I'm a junior contractor. I came here. I just put exclamation mark in here. I run the test. Everything is fine. Coverage is 100%. It can go to production. <laughs> You see, but you see that the business, the, the logic, business logic that is in production code is actually now, it was, the corner case was simple one, but you can see that I'm, instead of calculating prime numbers, I'm counting complex numbers. This is a serious bug. 
I totally reverse the logic of my application. And what are my tests saying? It's all good, go to production. Coverage is 100%, you can be proud of yourself. But do you see, a very easy change can be done, breaking everything, and your tests are saying, no, nothing is happening there wrong, or is good. Now, of course, if I add another test, I, will, I can cover this. You know, I, of course, I haven't choose this data for test by accident, it's on purpose. Because there's a funny thing in maths that for 2, 10 and 12, there is exactly the same number of primes and non-prime numbers lower than this. So this is a very special case, but you can imagine right now, if we could find such a non-trivial bug that can be put into your code for 10 lines of code, how many lines of code were there in our business logic? Uh, if I don't use enter that much, probably around 10. So in the 10 lines of code, I was able to miss really non-trivial thing. So now you can imagine in your complex systems, if you have hundreds of classes, how many such cases are not covered by your tests? How many things we can do as a quick change because this is some quick bug fix. We run the test, everything is green, everything is fine. We feel secure, but this is a kind of false security. We are not sure actually if our tests are really covering, if they are not a zombie test. If there are not tests that are there, they are green, but if I make a bug, they will be just, go ahead, right? So, let's get back into the presentation, to the slides. So, it will work, it works. So, the question is, where to use that? And the simple answer is, use it everywhere. As you can see, the PEAT is very lightweight. For our project, it takes less than a minute to write mutation testing. It doesn't, it doesn't cost much, but can save you, for sometimes it can improve the quality of your tests simply, and can save you hours of debugging, of hours of <laughs> fixing the bug on the production, because you will find that your tests are not covering something, and you, if you introduce a bug, you will know about it. So use it everywhere. It's lightweight, it's simple, there's no big cost to introduce PIT in your project. And the thing is, we very often focus on the quality of our code, right? There are plenty of tools that check your code quality. All the sonar, find bugs, PMDs, check styles, all this. But we really rarely focus on the quality of our tests. In one of my previous projects, the first thing I did after I was hired, I reviewed the unit test and what I found there was just like terrifying. Plenty of reflection, plenty of just checking if something is not new, Test without assertions. They were just executing some code without any assertions. What was this checking? Nothing. The bug was introduced, tests were run, they were checking nothing, so everything was green, we pushed it to production. And then, surprise, surprise, there are bugs. So this is something which can really help to improve your test quality, and with the low cost, it's really easy to implement it. So, yeah, this is like the end of my sentence. <laughs> we re really rarely think about quality of our tests, and this is like a bit scary sometimes, especially in big corporate world. The tests are somewhere there. We focus production features, etc., etc. Write tests, okay, it's, you have to write them, write them. But we don't focus on quality of our tests. And with mutation testing, you can eliminate the zombies I was talking about simply, right? Because these tests that are not checking everything will show up when you run mutation coverage. They will show that you can, in, they can input bugs in your code and your test, will tell, don't test anything, won't tell you anything. Another reason why I was using PEAT and mutation testing in general is because I'm a kind of an evil bad guy. And when I was doing review from some friend, uh, I was the picky guy, right? He was sending me code to review and I was like, oh no, these tests are bad, they are so bad. You are using reflection there. Come on, it's so, so bad. And the guy was like, no, you're wrong. You're wrong, these tests are green, they are okay. What do you want? The coverage is there. And, I, and you know, it's sometimes hard to convince someone when you say, I think it's bad. You know, facts versus opinions. I think these tests are bad is an opinion. And when I run muta mutation testing and show him, these tests are really, really wrong, you don't discuss with numbers, right? So this, for my mean ego down there, mutation testing was helping me with code coverage and proving 
that tests were low quality. Another thing where we can use mutation testing and where it's very useful are legacy systems. Some of us work in the brand new shiny projects with shiny technologies. So one of us, some of us deal with such monsters, spaghetti monsters. Refactoring of legacy systems is painful. We all know about it, but come on, there are techniques how to refactor, refa refactor do, do features in legacy code. Well, we know all how to do it, right? We get the code. If there are tests, then that's great. If there are no tests, we first write the test because yeah, we you want to be secure. We don't know how this code works because it's like, like Mount Everest, right? 8,000 lines. So we, don't, we want to be secured when, the, we, when we do changes in this code they are actually safe and we are not introducing another bug. But how many tests we need to write down there? Where to stop adding this test? When we are sure that we have covered everything? And actually, mutation testing is showing this. Because I have another example here. Uh -huh. It should now be visible. Because you can see that this, there is another code. Um, this is a code from working effectively with legacy code. This is an example, which actually I first time seen on Vodex presentation in Okado. Vodex is there. <laughs> so I've seen this code in, in his presentation for the first time. And the exercise here is, that Vodex is doing, we have a really crappy code with test luckily, and we want to refactor it so it's nice. And we have some tests, and I just, out of curiosity, I run mutation testing on that. And what is happening, actually, the tests are not enough. They are not checking two corner cases in here. So I'm starting refactoring. I think that I'm safe, but I can possibly introduce bugs and test will tell me it's all okay. They will be green. I will break the boundary conditions in here and I will think that I did a good job. Unfortunately, I would introduce a bug. So mutation testing, when you are working with legacy code, can show you if your tests are actually testing this code, if there are no gaps that you can fall into a trap and, and introduce bug. So, some final thoughts. We've seen this in action. So, what can be the final thought in here? Well, mutation testing is really cool. PIT is a really cool framework and I really recommend it. I'm using this in my project and it's making a good work. It's lightweight, it doesn't take much time to run mutation testing, it can check quality of your tests, it can save you from introducing bugs, improving your test quality, and there's like no cost, it's free, it's, I don't know if it's open source, but for sure it's free, so you don't have to do anything, you just put a Maven dependency and you can ch check your tests. You don't have to do it on continuous integration, you can do it from time to time, but get an information, get a feedback if your tests are really working. And the thing is that it's just a tool. And what can a guy who said at the very beginning that is focused on organization, on people, etc., what can tell you? This is a tool, it's yet another tool for quality, but the really important in our organizations are the people. <laughs> and I know how it sounds, I know this is like so, epic, like the people are most important. Every manager says this on every town hall. Our greatest asset are the people. And will there be bonuses? No. <laughs> so, the people. But truly, people are the most important and the way they work and maybe more important, how they think. So, don't just code, don't just test, but for me, when I'm working with people, it's important so what they do is to build kind of a culture of software quality. No matter what tools you do, no matter what tools you use to, to improve, to have this quality of your products, the, all the, the, the most important thing is the mindset and building this quality culture that we create a really high quality code. And that's it, people. People are the most important. These tools like Pete are really cool. They can help you, they can save your time. But the most important thing, the most important people are you. You people that are writing the code. You have the quality in your hands. You decide what will be the quality of your products and tools are only there to help you. And this is what I wanted to share with you today. So thank you very much.
if you want to get in touch, I'll be somewhere there, Neurocado. Oh yeah, questions, of course. <laughs> if you want to contact, I have a blog, but I don't write much. <laughs> I have a Twitter. On Twitter, I also don't write much because there's no space, but I post some selfies, so this way it's cool. <laughs> okay, questions, please. Okay, I'm using filters in, in my, my project. Uh, in coverage uh, testing, you, you may think that you might think that 90% or 90, 95% is a reasonable level. And it's very difficult to reach 100 in, in a real big project. It's very difficult to reach 100% uh, in mutation testing. So what, what level do you think that's reasonable to, to make mandatory for, for the team? Or As answer for every question in the world is it depends. <laughs> it, it very much depends on your project. In, in such a simple code, it, you can have 100% just like that. Yeah. In big projects, sometimes, yeah, you just simply cannot do this. And the question is if you need to have 100%. The, in general, I'm not a fan of coverage in itself as a met, itself as a metric because it doesn't tell you much, and it's like so easy to violate. This is what I've seen in corporate world. If you have coverage set to 80 or 90%, people will write tests that don't do anything, but they execute something, so the coverage increases. So I wouldn't go with any sharp level. This is something that can give you feedback about your test, and how you use it, it depends on you. So, yep. Yeah, so we used PyTest uh, in a Greenfield project like three, four years ago. Uh, it turned out to be a great tool in the beginning, but after a couple of months, uh, we experienced build times like eternity. <laughs> okay. Uh, is your how's your experience on that? Has the PyTest tool uh, evolved during the years? Is it faster now than it was a couple of years ago, or how is it? This is actually very interesting feedback because when I was using this in previous companies, um, I was mainly I was working with legacy code, so I was mainly using PID to investigate because you can configure what classes, what tests you want to check, and I was usually using this for a subset, mainly because the rest of the code, most of the code was not tested at all, <laughs> so it was really hard to use PID, PID on the entire project. Now we have microservices, and this time is very low. I don't have any experience, to be honest, on running this on huge systems. One friend of mine ran uh, Pete on uh, AssertJ. He just forked and pulled uh, AssertJ from GitHub, and there's about 50,000 or 60,000 lines of code, so Pete was running for around five minutes. But I don't have any experience like with uh, big, code like I don't know thousands of millions of lines of code but this is a good feedback it would be worth to try it to be honest to see how it when the number of lines goes up and tests go up how it works yep. if, you, if you run it twice are the mutations going to be placed at the same places or are, are they placed anywhere that they can be placed um, they will be it's deterministic it's placing mutations in the same places because uh, you, you cannot do like really complex mutations. You want, for example, change the business logic because yeah, this tool doesn't understand semantics. It only understands syntax. So you can see that these mutators were pretty simple. And it's just checking places in the code that you can just input mutation. And there is a set of mutators which is like a default one with this very simple one, but there's extended one which, which you can use and it runs much, much more mutations and they are more complex, but they are not in the default set because uh, Sometimes that simply can, can cause your code breaking. Yeah, but in general, the mutations will be in the same places. There's a, yeah? Sorry, I cannot hear you. Mm -hmm. Sorry. No, no, yeah, this is a kind of a fault. It's telling you just that you have hole in your tests. Um, the thing is, it's not telling you which test didn't find the mutation because none of them found the mutation, right? Okay, the other way around. Yeah, it's not telling you which test exactly found the mutation. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not my fault, I didn't wrote that, but <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Hey, if there are no more questions, then 
Sorry for the troubles with this. Uh, sorry for my stupidity with running Pete for the first time and it taking you waiting. But um, thank you very much for your attention and I hope you will start to. Thank you.